towards the end to come up with your own version, right? Based on this tutorial that we're going to see, right? No, it doesn't have to be, it's not about like, is it right or wrong, or did you leave out this important person or not? Um, I think the important thing here is that we're in a moment right now where it's actually really important that people in places like Jamaica write their own history. I mean, that relationship was really mediated a lot by um, an individual, by Diana, Diana Nowell, who was the lead curator on this exhibition. Um, she started coming to Jamaica first. Pam was trying to figure out what relationship they wanted to have to the Caribbean. So when they first opened in their new building, which was about 2013, they sent out all their curators to different parts of the Caribbean. Um, Tobias was a chief curator, went to like Barbados and a couple of places. And Diana and Mary Robles, who at the time was the head of education, came to Jamaica. I met them by chance when I'd been in Miami before. So you know, you meet somebody, you're like, oh, if you're coming to Jamaica, you should let me know. So they came and they got in touch with me and I put them in touch with NLS where they did a talk. Just kind of talking about what they did and so on. Um, and so our relationship kind of began to evolve from there. Diana was just really well liked and good at evolving relationships with people. And so she ended up also coming to work on the Jamaica Bionia as one of the guest um, judges. She also worked on the Caribbean Crossroads exhibition at PAM, right? They did a smaller version of the Caribbean Crossroads. And there was a dumpling in that exhibition. Um, it's not in this, um, it's not in this iteration of the exhibition, um, but it was in the, the first one at PAM. And she really liked that painting. And so when she came to Jamaica again, and she was doing stuff in the National Gallery, she was interested in seeing more of this because she liked that painting. And um, I think I did a tour with her. And at the time, we had the intuitive room was set up at that time. And there were a lot more donkeys in there, I went in, I saw them. And I, I always liked donkeys, so we just had a long conversation about those works. And she was just really taken with them. But it was just that, it was just like a, a really interesting conversation. A couple months later, I mean, made it more than a couple, it was like six, seven months later, she emailed me out the blue and she was like, she think it would be a good idea to do a donkey exhibition at PAM. And I was like, yeah, I think it would be a fantastic idea. I definitely think you should do it. Um, you know, and she, we just had like a short conversation. Who would be to some of the people who own some of the work, blah, 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 told her what I knew. And kind of just encouraged her to take it further. And those conversations kept evolving until it came to a point where she was like, oh, that approval to, to the show. Um, and so initially I wasn't involved in the exhibition. I, it was just that we were, were friends, actually, you know, sort of colleague friends. And so we would talk about stuff together. And then we got to a point where she said, you know, we're really need somebody to work on the ground in Jamaica and who kind of knows the, the landscape, would you be willing to, you know, do some work on the exhibition from that perspective? And she was like, you know, we give you um, assistant curator credit and uh, all of this and we need you to like talk with the collectors and these things. And I was like, sure, yeah, that sounds great. And then as the exhibition evolved, um, 
you know, she, Dan is a very easy person to work with. And I think we also have personal chemistry. We, we just enjoy each other. So it's easy for us to have long conversations, it's easy for us to come to Jamaica and we we'll just end up like spending a whole day driving around in my car, going here and there. And so the, the exhibition just evolved really organically from a place of mutual interest. Um, and then having all of these experiences together where we were discovering things. Um, it was also really cool because Diana has very much has a sort of art historical pedigree. Like she studied art history all throughout. She had worked in major museums. Her whole career has been strictly in curatorial in major museums. So she had a very different kind of experience from me. So there was like a lot of really nice exchange that happened for both of us, I think, through that. Um, and then she really just championed the exhibition to Pam. And, um, and I think Pam was interested in being engaged with the reason but wasn't sure how to negotiate that just yet. Um, and you know, in meetings that I was not present in, she was able to make a compelling argument to secure their support. Um, they ended up giving us a longer timeline. The exhibition was actually supposed to happen a year before it happened in the original plan. But there was so much to do. There was more investigation than we thought, and finding the work, and finding the collectors, and all of that. So it ended up being extended. Um, and then, I think, it was more of a success than any of us really, you know, that any of us really planned for. You know, it was just like a sort of, like I said, a personal interest kind of thing and it was like, well, is this something that could and then as we were in it, then it started to have all of this kind of uh, force because you're discovering things you're like, oh wow, this is really important, oh wow, this is really interesting, oh this could really go here and then it just um, built up really organically. So in that way it was a really beautiful project to work on because things came together really nicely and a lot of people Collectors, you know, the National Gallery of Jamaica, um, David Boxer, Pam, you know, Tobias there, um, you know, Franklin Servants, you know, different people came in at different times with just the right amount of interest, with just the right amount of like commitment um, to what was happening, and it just worked beautifully um, with all of those like communal forces. Um, but I give a lot of credit to Diana Foy because she really exhibited a lot of vision um, in the first place to, to even come up with it as an idea. Being clear about the fact that we have an art history that exists that is separate from global art history, so to speak, right? And that we all, we don't always have to be in the context of what was happening somewhere else, right? Work has been being done for years. People have been doing writing. There is a lot of good scholarship that exists about this place, right? Um, and being quite deliberate about having that hit up against global art, right? And forcing global art to contend with that. So, John Dunkley is unknown to you, but it's very, very well known to us, and it's very significant, and therefore you cannot just handle them any old way. You know what I'm saying? Because it, it matters, right? Um, and I think that in a way, Pam was a really good institution to work with, and Diana was a really good, um, person as an individual to work with who was prepared to take that on and engage that and sort of milk that for potential for how that could shape the exhibition so that's one thing um, because you know he's in many ways the first intuitive you know what I'm saying within all sort of canon he is a canonical figure all of that right um, but there's also this opportunity on the one hand to acknowledge the art history that does exist and to, um, to, to, to force 
um, people to contend with that, but on the other hand, to reinterrogate that history that does exist and take this repositioning of that history into a different space as an opportunity to ask new questions or to look from a different angle. Um, and I think that's something that did happen. Um, it happened for Diana and I, but I think it also happened for Dr. Boxer. Because if you read his essay in the catalog, um, which is one of the, if not the last piece of writing that he did, but that he'd been working on pretty much his, his whole career. Um, and then you read his earlier work on the intuitives and on Dunkley, there is a significant shift. There is a, a way that the way that we're talking about this artist changes. Right? So thinking about the intuitive category, even the word intuitive implies some of this. It's kind of like interiority, mysticism, um, spiritualism, all of that that goes along with that. I remember when the Dunkley show opened, here at National Gallery was a show called Spiritual Yards that was kind of exploring that aspect, which is an important aspect and should not be written out. Right? But you can see that with Dunkley, he has this super specific vocabulary. He's he, a lot of symbolism, right? And so you're like, oh, this is like the output of a very particular mind, right? But he's also incredibly engaged with his actual moment, right? This is not some like, as um, I think Vickery called him, a paintbrush mystic. He's not a paintbrush mystic. Like, this was a super sophisticated, knowledgeable man. He was um, well traveled. He was reading the newspapers. He was reading international media. He was commenting about everything from race and class relations to movies to horse races to the politics of the time to World War II. You know, this was a super savvy um, person. And so I think it's, it, it's significant to look back at an artist like this who was self-taught, who was a barber and a black man in um, colonial Jamaica, right? These tend to be flattened figures, right? Because history was not recording these people, right? But who left this whole body of work um, that gave him so much dimension, right? And that dimension is, the, the more that we look at it, the more that your final stuff about it. So even at this point, one of the things that Diana and I always like to talk about with this exhibition is that we want it to be an impetus to further scholarship because there's so much we still don't know. You know what I mean? If we could get the Smithsonian or one of those places that has those resources to like x-ray some of these things and see what the materials were, there's a whole other set of conversations that we could open up. Um, you know, when we talk about his palette, we think it's inflected by photography. He was looking at the lot of photography at the time. But other people have been like, maybe he was colorblind because this set of color. You know, there's so much possibility um, and so much stuff that we just really don't know and that gives really important insight into what was in fact a pivotal moment in Jamaica and world history, in the history of this whole world. Hemisphere, the Panama Canal, all of those kinds of movements, United Fruit Company, all of those things that we know are really significant to the world that we have today. This man was engaged with all of that and was actively reflecting and producing work in conversation with those moments from this very contemporary place, right? And so there is no shortage of possibility for what we can figure out about ourselves now in looking at the work but also in thinking about how we look at the work how the work has been looked at before it tells us so much about nature and building blah 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 you know i'm working on this for two years so i can talk about it for a long time <laughs>